a very good evening to one and all who have joined this uh, webinar and a union budget 2021-22 talk. Um, on behalf of Symbiosis School of Economics, um, I would request first Professor Jyoti Chandiramani, Director, Symbiosis School of Economics and Dean of Humanities of Social Sciences of Symbiosis International Deemed University. Ma'am, we request you to start this webinar by giving your welcome address. Um, good afternoon, uh, students, and good afternoon to our dear guest speaker for today, uh, Professor Lekha Chakrabati from the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy. Um, it's great having you here on board, Lekha Ji, and uh, we are really looking forward to having more engagement and interaction with you. We've been very well connected with NIPFP from a very long time when both my colleagues Suchi and Minal earlier have done refresher courses from uh, NIPFP. And uh, even with Ratan Roy, we've had very good connections at that point of time. We look forward to the same kind of engagement with your institution and most definitely with you. You're a very erudite speaker, writer, written large number of books. And we look forward to this wonderful engagement with you. When it comes to the budget, when we have two great speakers to speak today, I really don't want to um, uh, push into many um, pointers because I think I'll be coming in the way between the speakers and what my students want to ask. In fact, the questions that I wanted to ask of Lekhaji to answer is exactly what Varun has put forward to her uh, as to the, uh, you know, the extent of revenue that has remained stagnant or the expenditure, which really gives a negative fiscal stimulus in the year to come. So most definitely we are wondering how these six pillars are going to take shape. We've seen the health and well-being pillar, which has got a large number of um, other interventions clubbed with it to make it look very large. Uh, in terms of infrastructure, yes, that is something that needs to go in. But I feel when it comes to the push in terms of exports, I didn't see much being put done in that regard with the exception of the textile parks that came in. I'm sure infrastructure will add to trade facilitation and this will take things ahead. But where I definitely feel that the budget did, you know, uh, budget speech of uh, Dr. Nirmala, of uh, our finance minister, Nirmala Sitaramanji, and the economic survey speak in sync was really inclusive development where a large number of interventions which were highlighted talked about the ease of livability index, which is very much a very important aspect that is going on. Um, this is where, with respect to environment, with respect to Jal Jeevan, uh, you know, um, the, the water ministry that has been talked about with respect to um, housing and various other such interventions, which will lead to, and health, of course, you know, which was right the first pillar out there. Uh, moving ahead, um, I, I invite Lekhaji to talk about it, but I just want to highlight one aspect here that the sixth pillar, which is minimum government and maximum governance. When you look at that particular one from the school where I come in from my area of research urban, I feel this area is pretty neglected in terms of this particular budget. Uh, it's there, it's absent even in the economic survey. Uh, we have not really redefined urban. The way we define urban is extremely stringent. Uh, if you look at the global definitions of late, which have come out in 2020, which talks about almost 54% of population being urban, 54% uh, of almost built up area being, being urban. But in terms of land, uh, it's almost 94%, which is rural. And that's where, you know, you find, um, you know, the factor of production when land becomes difficult uh, to, to look into. We felt that 
the need to redefine urban to include large villages which are you know 10000 population and above and 5000 middle sized villages which are very often labeled as census towns this aspect is leaving us unaddressed with an issue on hand which makes it look which which makes us look very janus looking looking in one direction and not addressing the other and then creating a framework of unplanned unorganized development in such regions which will lead to further complication in the future but to more on urban we can talk later but with respect to the present budget 202122 over to you lekha ji for your comments on whether it is as we all have already thought of a supply side budget rather than a demand side budget but what is your take on how we will be able to push growth and with growth the employment that will translate thank you so much and welcome once again yeah thank you jyoti ma'am for your welcome address uh, before i uh, before we ask ask professor lekha to speak i would request dr suchi mishra to introduce our first speaker of the day thank you varun uh, good afternoon everyone it's a pleasure to have amongst us our first speaker dr lekha chakra uh, dr lekha chakravarti dr lekha is a professor at nipfp new delhi she is affiliated as a research associate with levy school uh, with levy economics institute of bard college new york she is a pioneer economist in institutionalizing gender budgeting in india she has authored and co-authored several books and has worked with imf world bank unscap undp un women and the commonwealth secretariat on short stints she is also a columnist with the financial express business line business standard the wire hindustan times scroll and also featured in cnbc ani dd news and rajya sabha thank you ma'am for accepting our invitation and we are really looking forward to some meaningful insights in this post budget talk today over to you lekha ma'am thank you thank you so much and it it's very special this invitation from uh, you know symbiosis school of economics and uh, professor jyoti and uh, myself we were in touch for a long time uh you know to, to come to symbiosis and deliver a talk to students but uh, you know uh it couldn't materialize because of the lockdown and uh, many other you know macroeconomic uncertainties uh you know but it is a very happy moment for me and thank you so much uh, suji and varun for this initiative and uh, as uh, professor jyoti ma'am uh, rightly gave the backdrop of this budget you know the context of this budget is exactly that uh, macroeconomic uncertainty uh, you know and this macroeconomic uncertainty uh, it's very hard to measure and uh, here the important component is the fiscal and monetary policy linkages so i thought that i will uh, you know base my talk on the macro fiscal framework of the budget and deba will a uh, you know focus as varun pointed out on the financial uh, you know and uh, the other aspects related to the equity markets and uh, when i talk about the macroeconomic framework of this budget the first thing is the focus on fiscal deficit it's a huge fiscal deficit number right now you know in the be for 2021 what we have visualized or pegged as 3.5 percentage of gdp of course we have the fiscal rules and budget management we have the fiscal consolidation path but at the same time in the pandemic times when we announced in the 2021 budget the revised estimates the fiscal deficit is now above 9% of gdp so it's a huge number even prior to the budget srimati nirmala sitaraman our finance minister has given a clue that don't fear deficit 
it's a kind of deficit is good narrative is what is floated in this existing budget. And to me, the budget is good narrative in times of pandemic is quite welcome because it's long due. Why I'm saying this, you know, just imagine the counterfactual. Had we been floating another set of fiscal austerity wave in order to have the fiscal deficit to GDP at the threshold norm of 3% of GDP, it would have affected the economic recovery path. So the high frequency data and the advanced estimates, it showed that you know, there is economic recovery in India, whether it is V-shaped or K-shaped, you know, that, that's a matter of debate. And if we focus just on the economic recovery and not focusing on widening inequalities, which Professor Jyoti Ma'am has, you know, properly highlighted in her backdrop in the introductory, uh, you know, in the, uh, in, in her, uh, what do you call, uh, in the opening address, what she mentioned is quite in a matter of concern that if we just focus on economic growth and if we don't focus on the widening inequalities whether or you know we are getting a v-shaped or a k-shaped recovery that that's a question and if you look at the gdp numbers on board the advanced estimates the details the meticulous details the growth is consumption led but it's not investment led so when the growth is consumption led the sustainability of growth is a matter of concern but at the same time, in the present budget, you know, there's a huge emphasis on infrastructure investment. And emphasis on investment is welcome because even if we are having a high fiscal deficit, the, you know, it is not preempting the loanable funds in the market, uh, which is otherwise available for the private corporate sector. And there may be a repercussion in terms of financial crowding out through the macroeconomic channel on the interest rates. So these were other concerns, but as a high fiscal deficit and the emphasis is on the capital spending, you know, that question whether this uh, investment or the investment led, uh, you know, narrative that's going to crowd in or crowd out private corporate investment, that's an empirical question. At the same time, I'm quite concerned that the investment capital spending to GDP ratio, of course, it is up from 1.6% of GDP to little about 2%, but it's still 2% of GDP. And also there's quite a bit of lack of clarity in terms of the financing pattern of the infrastructure investment we announced in the budget. But of course, budget just signalizes things. It is not everything, but it's a beginning of, uh, you know, that government is ready to take ahead the long-term reforms, which is long due and which is required for the capital infrastructure spending. That, that particular signaling, you know, I, I, I value that. But at the same time, there are concerns regarding the financing pattern of this infrastructure, the new, the national infrastructure pipeline, the kind of PPP models which we are going, we are visualizing for our country, like what is the kind of narrative and what's the component of the state versus center funds into it, the private funds of the foreign capital. These are the issues we have to wait and see. And of course, the other major issue is when it comes to the off budget liabilities. So we cannot celebrate a 9%, you know, fiscal GDP ratio, just as, you know, the government has focused on spend, spend, spend narrative. No, it's not exactly that. This 9% of GDP, we need to see the dichotomy, how much of it is coming from, you know, the budget transparency that was long due, the budget transparency issues they have focused and the kind of inclusion of the off budget liabilities, which was earlier there into the right current uh, you know the fiscal deficit number and what's a fresh kind of expenditure uh, you know priorities we have made in the budget and what is the impact of the revenue uncertainty and revenue fall so this decomposition is very important you know usually scholars have studied about you know the debt uh, to GDP ratio. And if I remember correctly, ISI, uh, you know, Professor Chetan and uh, Piali, 
uh, they have done a paper on how to decompose the public debt and what are the components which led to this public debt to GDP ratio high. So in that decomposition framework, in that analysis, it was a quite rich analysis, you know, they could identify that what are the components, what was the impact from rising interest rate, what was the impact from the, you know, the, uh, what do you call the denominator or the shrinkage of the denominator GDP, what is the impact on it through, you know, the other kind of primary balance of interest payments like that, we can decompose and see what are the determinants and what are the components which led to the high, uh, you know, deficit or debt dynamics, that's quite crucial. Now, coming to the question that for the first time ever, this budget, it, it's, it's a kind of a continuation of a series of mini budgets in the context of India, you know, first time ever in the pre, in, I mean, post-independent India. And these mini budgets, these were like economic stimulus packages since March 2020. And these packages had two important components. One was economic firefighting package. And second component was we visualize that this crisis has opportunities and what are the opportunities in which we can float the long-term policy uh, you know, imperatives. But when we talk about the long-term policy imperatives, whether it is labor reforms, whether it is privatization, you know, whether it is asset sale or the monetization of land, all these things we need to understand or whether it's related to the agriculture sector, the importance of having a consultative process and, the, and, you know, the dangers of having a fast push of, uh, you know, these reforms through ordinance route without consultative process, that, you know, differential uh, impact, I think uh, we are at the receiving end right now because of the lack of consultative process. So these are the questions related to the component on the long term reforms, but at the same time, if we are focusing just on the economic firefighting component and looking into only the cyclical aspects th through the budget or through the economic stimulus packages, the moment we understand that this is not a cyclical downturn is what is happening in the economy. It's an emerging economy context, but if it is not a cyclical downturn, if it is a permanent drop of income, it is not just cyclical and it's a temporary deviation and through the uh, you know, fiscal policy and monetary policy through proper, you know, policy packages, we will be able to get the U-turn uh, for the economic growth. We may not maybe a permanent drop in the income. You can see that, you know, in the literature, cycle strength, one article by Gita Gobindath in the context of emerging economies, whether in what business cycles operate. So here, the moment we feel that the structural components are relevant, we need to focus on the structural reforms. That's importance of having the long-term reforms. But of course, the way in which it is happening in our country, the consultative process, whether it is absent or not, that's a question, you know, at another. Now focusing on the cyclical part, uh, you know, if when you look at the monetary policy, that backdrop, of course, we have focused on three components. One was we have adjusted the repo rate. It is status quo for 4% over the few MPCs announcements right now. And, uh, you know, reverse repo rate also is kept in such a manner that we are nudging the commercial banks to, uh, you know, engage in the, uh, you know, the credit uh, deployment activities rather than parking the, the fund back in RBI. But despite that nudging, I think, uh, you know, commercial banks are parking money back in uh, RBI. That, that's a different context. But the liquidity infusion, that's quite a supply side. Whatever it takes narrative is what was adopted by the RBI in this uh, context of a pandemic and a heavy lifting. It was a heavy lifting uh, kind of, you know, economic reform. Stimulus packages were taken up by, uh, you know, uh, our monetary policy stance. But at the same time, unless we focus on the demand related aspects, whether the supply side liquidity infusion and the regulatory mechanisms and the kind of 
policy rate adjustments, whether they can be one-to-one -to, -one to trigger Indian economy is yet another question. So that was a backdrop in which, you know, we have floated our union uh, budget 2021. And if you look at uh, the budget, whether there is an economic stimulus package, it was not a huge economic stimulus package which was announced in the budget, but a rather it was quite targeted. Over the you know, economic pandemic packages, the mini budgets, if you look at these are very targeted, specialized kind of a you know, economic stimulus package. So whether the targeted economic stimulus packages are relevant for an upturn, for an economic, sustained economic recovery, or a huge, uh, you know, it's, it's not exactly like a helicopter drop of money, but you know, in this crisis, in the livelihood crisis, a huge support by government of India to the people to tide over the livelihood crisis and the widening inequalities in the form of a massive cash transfer is what is relevant, you know, that question is still unanswered. Maybe the philosophy in which the government of India floated the U union budget 2021 by not designing the cash transfer, maybe because it was like, I don't know whether it is all on the side of caution, but the revenue stability was considered as the base for designing the expenditure priorities. So it was not that they a huge synergy financing, which is the monetization of deficit or anything, but they have not gone to play the debt deficit dynamics by improving the, you know, the fiscal space through monetization of deficit and by designing huge demand, uh, you know, driven, uh, what he called the cash transfers into the hands of people, rather than that, they were focusing on targeted interventions, like one in the capital infrastructure. Second, the focus was on the public health infrastructure. In the public health infrastructure, as Professor Jyoti Ma'am rightly highlighted, we need to see the number correct. And it is not exactly the component of health, but many components have gone into the new centrally sponsored scheme on health, which is like termed as Prathan Mantri, uh, you know, Atma Nirbhar Swast Yojana. It was announced as a centrally sponsored scheme. But at the same time, if you look at the 15th Finance Commission report, that was also tabled in Parliament on the same day of budget. If you look at that uh, document, you know, there is a concern and there is a recommendation that, you know, we need to, you know, go for a convergence of centrally sponsored scheme and we need to have a cleansing process with relate to intergovernmental fiscal transfers in our country from uh, you know uh, the kind of conditional transfers to unconditional transfers so that kind of a cleansing process is happening of course it has started from the 14th finance commission when i think that is a sweet spot uh, you know, in the context of cooperative federalism, when they have decided that radical decision, uh, they have come up with the 42% of devolution to the subnational governments and incorporating climate change as a TOR in the Finance Commission, which is taking the economic growth paradigm little beyond growth, you know, by incorporating the climate change. These are the two important things that has happened in the intergovernmental fiscal transfers with 14th Finance Commission. And of course, it is retained in the 15th Finance Commission. The climate change is on board. It's not just focusing on offsetting fiscal disabilities and focusing on economic growth. There are more parameters in the intergovernmental fiscal transfers. At the same time, just like the ECB, the European uh, Central Bank, uh, the Christine Lagarde announced that uh, you know, in the monetary policy function, they may integrate the climate change climate change deliberations. But in our country, we have not started looking into whether climate change deliberations can be the part of monetary policy function. And on the fiscal side also in this budget, we have not seen a clear roadmap in terms of climate responsive budgeting. So climate, the humanitarian aspects, uh, you know, the migration crisis and other elements related to widening inequalities, these are the common components which require equal emphasis, just like the way we emphasis on the economic recovery. That's a point, you know, I would like to highlight. 
now coming to the question of the political economy of this budget uh, in terms of the intergovernmental fiscal transfer or the money flowing from the center to the states. Uh, you know, the students must be aware of uh, the literature by Harvard economist late, uh, you know, Alcino Alberto, you know, uh, he and his colleagues have done certain uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, looking into the empirical analysis of the political transfers, the political economy of transfers from the center to the state, what are the determinants of that, whether the dominant party at the center and the party at the subnational government, if they are different, what kind of issues, you know, related to the political economy of the transfers, whether the subnational governments in which the dominant party is not in power, whether these, they are at the receiving end or whether they suffer from lack of funds, uh, just like the way the other states in which the dominant party at the center and the states are the same. So these are the uh, questions related to even the calculus of consent. So so I think uh, in this budget, government of India has nudged that behavior, uh, the fiscal behavior, as well as the calculus of consent. You know, but we need to see whether economics of religion or ethno fragmentation, as it has, it's there in the global literature, whether those kinds of non-economic factors matter, or the signaling in the budget that we are ready and the transferring, uh, your or emphasizing on the capital infrastructure spending at the subnational levels, especially the states in which the dominant party is not there, like Kerala and West Bengal. So these are the new kind of nudging experiments which were put forward to the budget. But we need to wait and see what's the kind of calculus of consent that is, uh, you know, coming out of it. Now, it is not only the levels of deficit that matter. We need to look into the financing pattern of deficit as well. So in this budget, if I look into, of course, I mentioned that we pegged it 3.5, but it is overshoot more than 9% of fiscal deficit. And if you look at the financing pattern, the prominent way of financing deficit at the center government level is still the you know, market borrowings, okay? So if the market borrowing is the single most significant way of financing the deficit, then the repercussions may be on interest rate. So this question need to be empirically analyzed. And researchers have shown that, you know, in the, in the time of crisis on the recession, it may not have huge impact on the interest rate or the monetary policy variables for that in that sense, you know, even I have a paper recently published, uh, you know, I, I collaborated with the econometrician and we have done this paper for the handbook of, uh, you know, the R, the Statistics and Econometrics, uh, edited by Sia Rao and uh, Rishikesh. In that paper, you know, we proved that for private corporate investment, more than monetary policy variables like rate of, rate of interest, it is fiscal policy that matter, especially the public infrastructure investment. From that sense, this emphasis on capital spending uh, by the center government to trigger the animal spirits of the investors' confidence, that that's quite right. But of course, there is an ambiguity related to how we are going to finance the you know, uh, infrastructure spending. That's a matter of, uh, you know, uh, immense concern as Professor Judy Mam also rightly highlighted in her talk. And of course, this is a, a kind of revenue uncertainty, the tax, projections what we visualize and what we are going to get that fiscal marksmanship or the fiscal forecasting errors is quite huge in the time of pandemic so where is the fiscal space and how we are going to visualize that fiscal space for this pandemic budget that's an important question and what we we saw in the budget is the emphasis on disinvestment and the privatization so when we see this privatization as an imperative of getting the fiscal proceeds and without getting into the other kinds of dimensions of you know, labor market repercussions and also the prelude, the regulatory frameworks, I think uh, you know, we have to be very careful when we float the privatization uh, you know, initiators in our country, just, you know, from the uh, perspective of getting fiscal proceeds, uh, because, uh, you know, if, if we have seen the last budget, 2020, what was our aspiration for the disinvestment dis dis proceeds in the capital receipt? 
and uh, what was the reality. That's a huge, that's a fiscal forecasting error. That's huge. So in this budget also, we visualize that that's a way in which we uh, go ahead with the fiscal space, but we need to wait and see whether that forecasting error will be minimized in this year and uh, what's a kind of road map in which the privatization is going to be rolled out in our country so uh, maybe uh, this is this is a uh, you know time in which we look into the fiscal rules uh, from a new normal perspective we have the new frbm and you can take a look at the clauses of the new frbm in the financial bill it's the third time we are amending the uh, you know, fiscal rules. So that, that's the new normal. That's a new macro fiscal framework of this budget. And institutions, of course, Professor Jodi Mem has pointed out about the governance issue. Of course, the governance deficit is equally a matter of concern, just like the way we have, we are concerned about the huge fiscal deficit, of course. But, you know, we need to see that the implementation and the execution will also be on board effectively so that the efficacy of this macro fiscal framework will be properly translated into you know outcomes and the excessive deficit procedure to get the deficit back to the original equilibrium levels so that part is narrated in the budget but we need to wait and see how this excessive deficit procedure is going to be you know uh, taking a shape uh, so with that you know deficit is good narrative uh, this narrative i quite value in the time of pandemic and of course and that is floated with the concern that there is an excessive deficit procedure fiscal fiscal consolidation roadmap uh, they're uh, quite solid uh, in the budget and uh, over to you varun I will take up the questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Lekha. Thank you for a talk. And uh, let me be uh, honest, ma'am. Actually, uh, I just was remembering my macroeconomic lectures of my master's when I used to discuss with my teacher, my Professor Abdut Nadkarni. He used to come and discuss about or the budget from different lenses, whether it was fiscal deficit, whether what is the impact it will have on interest rate or inflation. But you also gave a very comprehensive view. Uh, I will first like to start with the questions. And first, I would request Professor Jyoti Chandiramani. Ma'am, uh, could you just unmute yourself and uh, share your questions, ma'am? Or yeah, clarifications or your discussion. Uh, you know, um, always students love to hear an expert speak on this. And you're more the fiscal expert than any anybody here today. Um, so some a, a few uh, pointers. What should have the government done to enhance the animal spirits? You talked about the animal spirits, which are lacking. And so here is one question that I have. What should the government have done? Because investment is down nearly 10%, you know, uh, between 2010 and now. From 39, nearly it's down to 29 point something. My second question to you is, um, you talked about disinvestments and privatization. Uh, you did mention this, but uh, I, I thought I'll take your opinion on this. Um, is it a case of short run gains over long term dividend losses to the government? Um, should the government be careful because I think they're going to depend upon the dividend and in privatization in the fiscal 202122 majorly. And my third question is, uh, what is your views on the scope for new banks which come from the corporate sector? Because um, India definitely is underbanked and we need new banks. And uh, there is already a committee looking at corporates coming in as banks. I think that's also being weighed after the fact that there are very little other options for banks to come in. So uh, over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, those are brilliant uh, questions, but my answers may be partial because it's a dynamic situation. And uh, we need to see because the union budget signalized things, but how it's going to be played, that game we need to wait and see. And your first concern about uh, the animal spirits, and here we have two uh, important policy tools. One is macro policy, 
uh, on the from the fiscal side and the other is a monetary macro and we have seen that there is no uh, one to one quite a powerful link from the you know policy rates to triggering the investment or the animal spirit so when monetary policy stance had got limitations in triggering the animal spirits what can fiscal dominance hypothesis or fiscal dominance can do about it so to me uh, you know there is a disconnect between the financial exuberance and real economy that 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 you know that i acknowledge before i mentioned this but to trigger the animal spirits uh, you know thinking that we need to have macroeconomic fundamentals quite strong so deficit is one of the macroeconomic fundamentals we need to keep that within the fiscal rules to 3% so that investors confidence and the animal spirits will be you know quite good that was the you know narrative which was happening so far that macroeconomic fundamentals needs to be strong and within that one parameter is a very stable fiscal deficit but right now in the time of pandemic even that high fiscal deficit you know if you see the financial exuberance after the budget i think the markets have read that quite correct uh, that 9% that is very much required that economic stimulus package and that signaling on the capital infrastructure that that's quite working i think uh, but at the same time uh, the credit uh, rating or uh, you know the, uh, the what do you call the animal spirits and the credit rating agencies evaluation of the our economy uh, this is not a time to gig i think focus more on that just because the way you highlighted the concerns about the inequalities what is the role of fiscal policy and instead of floating another wave of austerity you know we need to have spending on board so in that uh, from that perspective you know this high fiscal deficit is okay and uh, you know to trigger that uh, from the animal spirits from that point of view i do think that what we were lacking in our country is a uh, capital investment the capital the gross fisc- fixed capital formation was coming down in many sectors over the years because of the subnational governments we were over adjusting to the fiscal rules by you know adjusting to that by cutting down the so the consumption led growth narrative was you know quite prominent but i i think that uh, the narrative that the capital investment led growth uh, you know that may be one single most uh, significant factor that can lead to you know triggering the animal spirits that that's what i do expect and now coming to the next question of disinvestment and the privatization of course uh, it's a short run uh gains uh, but the long term cost is there you know i don't have any empirical evidence to suggest that the privatization was quite powerful and it, it, the efficacy of the privatization because if, if i remember correctly we have uh, done an experiment with the hindustan singh limited uh you know there was a kind of uh, you know increasing the cap of uh you know the private uh, component into the hindustan singh limited and we were doing that experiment and getting the dividends so uh, i don't know whether it can be a blanket option for all the public sectors in our country i don't know but we need to wait and see because it's it's after a long time the privatization that word was you know floated in the budget from such a bold perspective so we have to wait and see how this is going to be uh, you know rolled out in the country but at the same time i have concerns when privatization is looked only from the perspective of fiscal space or providing the uh, you know proceeds uh, for financing the deficit because it has got many other aspects as i said in my uh, talk earlier also you know it has got many other dimensions including labor market repercussions uh, including other regulatory uh, you know framework so we need to wait and see how this is going to be there but to me if i am asked what is the way in which we can get the fiscal space corrected uh, uh, maybe uh, my emphasis was little on the side of a uh, debt deficit dynamics than the focus of the on you know on privatization you know i think that uh, we can maneuver with the debt deficit dynamics uh, in the sense uh, we had of course we had the operation twist uh that experiment by rbi it's like simultaneous buying and selling of uh you know bonds like selling of 
uh, short-term bonds and getting the long-term bonds and correcting the bond market uh, maturity structure by elongation of the debt, uh, you know, that maturity pattern. So these are the ways in which we can get a long-term trajectory for economic growth uh, without having the refinancing risk. So there could be uh, more calibrations that can happen on the debt deficit front rather than going for an asset sale. Uh, so I have concerns regarding this, but let's wait and see uh, how it's going to be rolled out and how the fiscal marksmanship is going to be perfect in this case. And the last question regarding banks, of course, ma'am, our, our country is largely unbanked, you pointed it out, but uh, we have uh, floated yeah, like new licenses uh, and uh, the kind of candidates came up for the new licenses where corporate joins. Otherwise it's like ID, uh, you know, uh, if yeah. you're, yeah, yeah, but that they are focusing on the long term infrastructure investment, which is very much important. And of course, the kind of financial inclusion aspects, the considerations regarding financial inclusion is equally relevant when we talk about opening new banks, because it's not just profitability is, of course, not a bad word, but at the same time, the concerns for the financial inclusion, whether that's properly uh, placed on board. Uh, so that's my concern when we talk about, uh, you know, opening the new banks and that also from the corporate sector. And at the same time, as for the basal norms, the capital adequacy ratio, all these questions, you know, it is not there. So there is moral hazard if we are going for uh, again and again recapitalization. Uh, you know, mode uh, by uh, to cleanse the balance sheet. So these are the matter of concerns. But of course, along with profitability, unless we focus on financial inclusion, uh, you know, we may not get it uh, right. Uh, though we we will go for penetration of bank branches and opening up of more banks to solve uh, that our country is largely unbanked. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Oh, thank, thank you. For for your very explicit answers. Thank you. Um, now I would uh, take a few questions from students as well. So I request Pawan, our uh, uh, student. Pawan, can you please unmute and um, ask your question to ma'am? Am I audible? Yes, Pawan, go ahead. Professor Lekha, thank you very much for the information, ma'am. It was a very uh, great talk and I uh, am currently an alumnus of Symbiosis. I'm in my final year of master's in the University of Hyderabad. So I have two questions and very short. The first one is economic survey talks about the debt situation, the public debt situation in India being at comparable levels relative to other countries and says that even if the government spends, the debt is going to be sustainable enough. And to use this, uh, to arrive at this point, it uses an argument by Professor Blanchard, which is the IRGD being into, uh, very negative in India. So is it really sustainable? And uh, if not, what are the concerns? And the follow-up question is to, uh, to talk about debt sustainability. Is the IRGD, that is the interest rate growth rate differential, a very good indicator? Or if not, what is an alternative indicator we can think about to see whether that is really sustainable or not. That's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that questions related to public debt. You know, even before the economic survey and during conversations, uh, you know, Professor Krishna, uh, our chief economic advisor of our country, and, uh, you know, Pinaki, uh, who is a current uh, director of NIPFP, I think they had conversations regarding the sustainability of public debt. And even in those conversations, you know, as you pointed out, Pavan, the concern about the public debt sustainability uh, was discussed and uh, the kind of, you know, if I remember correctly, you know, they were talking about uh, what Oliver Blanchard has highlighted, uh, like, you know, in, uh, if the R is, uh, not greater than G. If the real rate of interest is not greater than the real growth of economy, I think we can maneuver with the public debt. It's not exactly the strict, uh, what do you call the 20% for the states and the 40% for the center. And we have a threshold public debt. It is not like that. When uh, you know your R is not greater than G, then you have 
a policy space. Uh, that that's what Oliver Blanchard. This is his, uh, you know, uh, emphasis in the American Economic Association conference in Atlanta in 2019, where he was given in, uh, given the presidential address, and in that address he was like uh, mentioning that. You know, we need not bother bother about uh, the fiscal rules. A moment, uh, we can forget about that because the austerity is bad at this moment. And if R is not greater than G, then you can go ahead with, uh, you know, uh, with with, with uh, public debt. Uh, and uh, two things he mentioned. I, I think Professor Krishna also mentioned that in the economic survey. Uh, you know, two things are mentioned. If you are using your public debt to reduce the output gap. Okay, what is output gap? It's the difference between your potential output and the actual output, actual GDP and the potential GDP. So if it is for the output reduction, you're having a high fiscal of a public debt, you know, that that's quite okay because output reduction is very important in our country. At the same time, I know the controversy regarding the output gap from the methodological perspective that how we arrive at the potential output, the potential GDP in the context of India because we use econometric filters and uh, take out uh, what you call and I think Meenal, uh, uh, Suchi, we are all aware of this because we have spoken about this in an IPFP when we were doing the debt deficit dynamics talk by Pinaki. So we, we are aware of that controversy but at the same time if your high public debt is used for reducing the output gap or it is for the improvement of the economic uh, recovery or for uh, stimulating sustained economic recovery, you know, that, that's quite valuable, it's okay. Because fiscal discipline is growth enhancing. That narrative is under attack right now because fiscal discipline was not growth enhancing. So, so that the counterfactual is what Oliver Blanchard in his American Economic Association conference lecture, what he has spoken about is that a good deficit, a good debt, uh, you know, it's quite valuable for having the output reduction. And in that context, he also mentioned that if you have arithmetic or numeric levels of deficit, such kind of fiscal rules, you keep it, but don't use it. So that's the way, you know, he stopped his a lecture and he told that public debt is not uh, good, but at the same time, public debt in the times of recession is not that bad. So that's a perspective. So R is greater than G is a matter of concern. Then we have to eventually monetize the deficit and we are getting into that unpleasant monetary arithmetic situation. Is it okay, Pavan? This was your concern, right? Ma'am, actually, Pawan cannot unmute himself. I'll just ask if he has a follow-up. Yes, Pawan. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. That was uh, very clear. And the second uh, follow-up was whether IRGD is a good indicator or not. If not, what would be the other alternative indicator we can look at? Ma'am, what is IRGD? Oh, what's the full Pawan? Lekha, ma'am. Yeah, thank you, Pawan, for that question. Uh, you know, uh, 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 other indicators, I think this takes us to the Fiscal Responsibility and Management at Committee, where Arvind Subramaniam put his dissent note about the operational parameter in the context of India should not be fiscal deficit, it has to be primary deficit. So if you're opening up that rich debate right now, Pavan, uh, you know, I also have concerns whether fiscal deficit is the right kind of operational parameter in the context of India, because we have a huge off budget liabilities. So the moment we talk about the macroeconomic policy repercussions of the deficit, we cannot just confine to fiscal deficit because this budget transparency has happened only in this budget by incorporating a component of of budget liability here otherwise the ideal measure uh, you know is public sector borrowing requirement so maybe in future india will compute the public sector borrowing requirement by incorporating the three levels of deficit we call as a general government 
you know concept of deficit plus the intra uh, you know public sector transactions so we don't have the data ready for the intra public sector transactions that's why we are not at, uh, you know capturing the public sector borrowing requirement also we need to get the data ready at the third year so general government expenditure or the general government deficit that concept uh, of uh, you know psbr uh, that that's an ideal concept and of course the moment arvind subramanian focus on the primary deficit i think uh, what uh, his focus was like we are you know looking into the current fiscal policy stance by deducting the interest payments from it and the interest payments of course it has the intrinsic rate of interest and the past debt and the rate of interest is exogenous uh, to the uh, fiscal policy authorities so focusing on the primary surplus whether that is relevant or not but i think uh, you know economies borrow less we are focusing on the fiscal deficit as an operational parameter and in the current budget also that focus is quite strong that our operational parameter is fiscal deficit but not at primary deficit and look at the golden rule golden rule uh, it's like revenue receipt should be equal to the revenue spending so in the context of pandemic we cannot consider revenue expenditure as bad and if you look at uh, the current uh, budget you know it is not zero and i'm quite happy about it the focus on uh, capital infrastructure is one thing but the revenue expenditure is at another you know unless we focus on revenue expenditure in terms of social infrastructure there will be you know problem uh, these are commanding heights not the soft sectors of our education or health anymore because over the years the narrative was that we need to control the social sector deficit if the tax buoyancy is not okay expenditure compression is the path to fiscal consolidation so that narrative we, we are at the receiving end when pandemic hit our economy you know the kind of expenditure uh, norm in the health sector it was below 1% of gdp so where we could uh, you know uh, i uh, adapt or whether we could respond to the pandemic quite properly these are concerns uh, and uh, right now there is a focus on in the budget in terms of uh, central sponsored scheme but at the same time as professor uh, jyoti ma'am rightly pointed out how it has arrived at that number the central sponsored scheme in the health sector that's a matter of concern of course it's not like a profligacy or anything that health for all Uh, like an insurance scheme or anything which could have been catastrophic because it, it, it you know even if it's government led insurance package you know it, the catastrophic nature of the out of pocket spending by the poor households may can go further catastrophic if it is not properly interpreted by the insurance companies it can overall lead to the health sector you know further expensive all these concerns are there so in your question uh, i think government of india took the stand that we still value you fiscal deficit as the operational parameter and of course this opening of all these parameters by your by pavan that's it's quite a relevant way of looking at it that uh, whether we there is a reemergence of monetized deficit whether we need to uh, you know uh, phase out the golden rule these are the questions we need to look into when we talk about the operational parameters thank you Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, Pawan has messaged that you have uh, answered his query, and he thank you for that. Uh, ma'am, uh, Mayuk has a question. After Mayuk asks a question, I will ask a similar question, and then you can take both of the questions together. Uh, Mayuk, can you please go ahead with your question? Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Uh, as you pointed out in your uh, speech, that uh, this union budget of 2021 has put emphasis on infrastructural development, capital expenditure, to some extent privatization. But when we look at an important determinant that because that is consumption, uh, and, and not in the backdrop of COVID-19, but since 2016, we have seen a decline in the consumption. So in that context, ma'am, is has this year's budget? have properly emphasized on that or is there any indicator suggesting that there would be an increase in consumption or has this year budget like the last year also missed out on that indicator as such yeah uh, thank you mayuk ma'am i have a uh, question uh, which is on the uh, expenditure of government on social sector schemes like manrega or consumer affairs or pm kisan nidhi so uh, although the budget says of 29 uh, this budget has mentioned that the last year spending it had given the numbers so some uh, the amount was not fully spent and this year we have seen 
uh, curtailment in the or you know maybe five percent or ten percent reduction in the expenditure. So in this context of this pandemic budget, um, would you like to share your uh, perspective in the sense as a student when we understand that how budgets are prepared, uh, what are the things you know how should we take this as a Thank you, ma'am. If you could address these two questions. Thank you. Thank you, Varun, and thank you, Mayuk, for these brilliant questions. Let me take Mayuk's point first. Uh, you know, that uh, his, uh, uh, you know, uh, concern about whether we have given adequate emphasis on the consumption, the demand side. Uh, you know, uh, one thing is that uh, maybe the philosophy of government of India by not designing the huge cash transfer maybe because uh, like uh, you know what they uh, you know assume is that uh, it may not trigger the consumption but if the people have the propensity to save rather than the propensity to spend you know it may not trigger consumption it may not trigger demand so that's one thing but of course in the time of livelihood crisis a judicious mix of what you called as a consumption related uh, announcement and what Varun was talking about that the government you know should not have reduced the employer of last resort related spending so these are important uh, factors which are required for stimulating uh, the demand side but uh, you know there is a concern that the announcements are just confined to supply side uh, from the monetary policy angle that it's just li liquidity infusion from the fiscal policy side it is just announcement of infrastructure but at the same time uh, it, for widening inequalities or to stimulate the consumption of the demand side our policies were you know not uh, that uh, you know, uh, uh, significant, uh, that, that, that concerns are very well taken. Uh, but, you know, uh, this is the concern. Like, if you look at the numbers, if you look at the data, the precautionary savings, uh, you know, in India, the private savings is on the rise. So if the propensity to save is greater than the propensity to consume, uh, you know, how can these policies be valid? Uh, so that's, that's one thing. And second, uh, if you ask me, I do go by a judicious mix of participation income and basic income in the time of pandemic. Uh, of course, from the demand stimulation perspective also. You know why? Because uh, when everything else failed, uh, you know, even after that global financial crisis, if you look at, uh, you know, in the stimulus package, employer of last resort policy by guaranteeing jobs to the people worked quite well. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of concern when uh, the allocations related to, uh, you know, the employer of last resort policy is showing a decline because we may see uh, a recovery, growth recovery from the high frequency data or from the national uh, advanced estimates, but that, uh, you know, that uh, GDP may be profit led when there is a decline in jobs in our country, when there is a, you know, massive cut in the salary. So the kind of profits, uh, you know, that by the enterprises may be showing up in the recovery, but at the same time, uh, if, if you don't emphasize properly on the employment related programs and uh, the repercussions, especially from the lower income quintiles, you know, that that's uh, that that is going to create further polarization. And it is a matter of concern uh, in, th that may widen uh, the inequalities. So it's not a debate between participation income. Uh, like participating in the economy and earn an income or a universal uh, cash transfer or the basic income that you don't have to participate, but it's a kind of helicopter drop, but it's not the trade-off, but it could have been a judicious mix. But, uh, you know, government of India, rather than going through this huge stimulus, stimulus packages to stimulate the demand, what they have done is they have gone into the structural supply side reforms, uh, maybe on the philosophy that revenue stability is very important and uh, fiscal space to float the economic stimulus package are limited in the context of our economy when compared to the advanced countries. But at the same time, you know, the monetization of that deficit, like uh, what we say as M 
by uh, what you call this money financing of fiscal programs. This is what we have not yet explored in the context of India, that MY, uh, MFFP, the money financing of fiscal programs. So, uh, you know, the worry is that there may be pressure on currency, there may be inflationary potential, uh, because over the years we have controlled that money financing of fiscal program, and we have gone to bond financing of deficit. So once again, if you're opening that re-emergence of monetized deficit, you know, uh, what are the kind of repercussions it can have on the economy or whether should we should be bold uh, enough to, you know, go ahead with the synergy financing rather than opening the external financing or anything or the asset, the huge asset sale in which we visualize that we are going to get the fiscal space through the proceeds. So these are open-ended empirical questions, uh, but I do have this concern related to, uh, you know, what Mayuk told about uh, stimulating demand or stimulating consumption and the kind of expenditure compression that's happening to reach the fiscal consolidation rather than through the tax buoyancy path. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Lekha. Uh, due to paucity of time, I will not be taking any further questions for Lekha, ma'am. But if you have any questions, ma'am, do replies on her email or whether on Twitter. So uh, thank you, Lekha, ma'am. And uh, definitely your address uh, also would have raised few questions to students and would uh, make them read more on this topic or maybe take them for research as well for their dissertations, etc. Thank you, Lekha, ma'am, once again, thank from you. on behalf of SSE, we thank you for sparing time and addressing all our questions, including thank on you, behalf of Mayuk also, we thank you, ma'am, for answering our questions. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Be there on Twitter with me, and yes, I will take up the questions later. Thanks yes, a lot, yes. and wish you all the best. Thank you very thank much. You, uh, I now move on to our second speaker of the day. Uh, I welcome Dr. Um, I welcome Devapam Chaudhary. Uh, first of all, I apologize that we are slightly running behind schedule and so to keep you waiting. Uh, I have uh, firstly, uh, this is our second time we are having inviting uh, Devapam sir. And uh, so Devapam has done his master's from Gokhale Institute from 2003 five batch. And after that, he has been uh, with the corporate sector. So he has uh, he has worked for different corporate firms, and presently, past few years, he has been working with chief economist as a at Piramal Group. So one of the things is he does advises his uh, enterprise group on different matters, whether it is treasury, whether it is macroeconomic fundamentals, whether it is forecasting of different macroeconomic parameters. And as we have mentioned in the slide, he has been uh, among the panel for different RBI committees and different think tanks. So without wasting much time, uh, Devopam sir, uh, we welcome you and would request you to unmute yourself and share the concern about or the perspective on from the financial perspective, from the corporate perspective, from the equity side, uh, what are the implications of this budget or how does industry looks at this budget? Uh, over to you, Devopam sir. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Varun, for the introduction. And thank you for having me here a uh, second time and having the patience to hear, hear me out for the second time. So, you know what, given a choice, I would I would love to sit with the audience and continue hearing what Lekha Ma'am had to say, because it's such a pleasure to, to hear her and her views that you, there's, there's limited uh, reasons for you to stand up and talk, right? So that's that's something which I was realizing when I was uh, listening to Lekama. But any which ways, uh, I'll I'll also give share some of my understanding of what this budget is going to do, especially to the Indian corporate sector. So uh, just to start with and and to give you some context, you know, every economy or economic activity is kind of hinged on three factors of production largely. One is labor second is capital and the third one is productivity and this is something that every basic microeconomic textbook would teach you right so this government in a very simplistic way for the last five six years have been targeting each one of these factors of production and try try to refine them 
So for, if you remember for the last uh, three, four budgets, there was a huge amount of impetus and focus on, on revitalizing the various uh, IITs, opening up new uh, IITs, new IIMs, uh, AIM, AIMs where this, the, the number of AIMs were, were increased across the country. So all these, and, and of course, the huge amount of focus on Skill India by, by revitalizing the, the polytechnics. So this was nothing but uh, strengthening the, the first factor of production, which is labor. This budget, and in fact, the various announcements under Atmanirbhar Bharat scheme, which happened post COVID, and, and very intelligently, the government, you know, metamorphosed not just COVID relief package, uh, COVID relief announcements, but also long term development plans through these Atmanirbhar Bharat packages and the budget. And they were, they were largely focused around capital and productivity. Now, we all know that India is a capital staffed country. We have huge amount of labor abundance, but then the quality of labor often is questioned and, and is the productivity. And obviously capital is always under short supply. So, so this budget, the way I see it, it provides or will provide in the next few years, a huge surge in the availability of capital to the corporate sector, something that the corporate sector has been deficient in or has not been receiving as much as they should have. And, and this was kind of the topic of my previous talk. If, if I have an overlapping set of students hearing this, you, you remember that how uh, the, the CapEx cycle slowed down very significantly, especially after 2016, and it never picked up, unlike uh, how, how sharply it picked up before every other economic crisis that this country saw, be it the 1991 EOP crisis or the Asian financial crisis, or even as recent as the GFC. After every crisis, there was a huge capital surge. There was a rise in capex, but that was missing after, you can say after the taper tantrum in 2013, and it was much more pronounced. The slowdown became much more pronounced after 2016. So I think there has been some very momentary steps, which has been, or monumental steps rather, which has been taken by this government. Uh, through the budget as well as the various Atmanirbhar Bharat package tranches last year. And I'll, I'll talk uh, about them in a while. Uh, and, and just to you know keep get, get this out of the way before getting into the capital market uh, discussion, uh, it would be amiss if I don't refer to the fact that the huge amount of focus, which in fact it was made into a key pillar of the budget and that was the expenditure on health and wellness, right? So that saw an increase of more than 130% compared to where it was last year. And this again is targeted. So health and well-being uh, is, is kind of a function of productivity. So it directly you know, talks to the third uh, aspect of, uh, or the third factor of production, which is labor productivity. So again, a very smart move by the government. Uh, so that 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 was uh, the very thought thoughtful uh, uh, measure, and apart from being a very positive, having a very positive impact on the economy and in terms of improving the health and well-being of the workers in the economy, be it urban and rural, it'll also thrive the ailing pharmaceutical and healthcare businesses uh, in the country. Now let's come to the capital market uh, uh, interventions that this uh, budget uh, did. So. Obviously, India has this tremendous rating risk, uh, which we are con constantly exposed to. Any moment there is this possibility of either a Fitch or a Moody to downgrade us from our current rating of triple B minus, which is the fair minimum investment grade, to a rating lower than that, which will essentially make India a junk country, like a Brazil or a couple of other similar emerging economies. However, the and, and, and the rule of thumb that these rating agencies follow is whenever you know debt to GDP ratio and the GDP growth rate does not gel with each other in, in, in a manner that they are interested to see and look at it. So for example, if the debt to GDP ratio is steeply going down, or sorry, going up, and at the same point of time as the GDP growth is coming down, then that's a sure shot sign for these rating agencies to, you know, consider a downgrade uh, for an for a emerging economy like India. Now the government took that aspect and, 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 you know, and now made announcements which would pacify the rate, rate rating agencies on those regards. 
So if you remember the Atma Nirbhar Bharat tranches, they had, apart from various announced short-term announcements of free food and migrant labor, uh, easier policies for migrant labor classes, they had a, a many long-term uh, uh, announcements which would ensure that the, the FDI scenario opens up, the, the, there's further liberalization of the corporate sector and so on and so forth. And this was carried forward in the budget also. Now, this was solely, obviously it had a growth on the reform uh, uh, narrative to it, but it was also targeted towards pacifying the credit trading agencies, saying that, okay, we are in a mess, we need to spend more, we need to do a lot of expenditure, which means our fiscal deficit will go way beyond what the FRBM Act stipulates. But then we are also at that same point of time taking care of these long-term reforms, which will ensure that the next three years, next four years, or maybe in the next five years, our fiscal deficit uh, as a percentage of GDP or our debt to GDP numbers will definitely come down and India will be in a very strong position to honor all its, all its debt obligations. So that was a strong messaging which went out to Fitch, which went out to Moody. And uh, if you are tracking the newspapers, you will realize that yesterday only Fitch came up with a press release saying that they are quite uh, satisfied with the way the government has managed its budget despite the high fiscal deficit number. Though they have still showed some amount of uh, 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 skepticism, skepticism around the fact that whether India would be able to bring down the fiscal deficit number to uh, four and a half percent by 2025, that's what the projections are, if I'm not wrong. Uh, but still, for the time being, for the next eight, nine months, they are not looking at a downgrade uh, of the country's uh, of credit trading, which is a very big win for this budget, I would, I would put it that way. It is a big win in front of the credit trading agencies, it's a big win in front of the foreign investors and obviously it is a big win in front of domestic investors as well and the immediate impact of this is the significant amount of inflows fii inflows which are again broken down into fpis and fdis there's there's a surge in these inflows which has happened especially post budget and rbi is having literally having a tough time to mop up all these additional cash so that there is the, the indian currency does not you know appreciate too much so that it starts hurting the ex exporters. So it's it's common demand and supply logic, right? And if in the ex foreign exchange market, a lot of US dollars starts to come in, it's because the FPIs are all interested in investing in India, then the supply of dollar would increase, supply of rupee would be going down, and the net impact would be the USD INR exchange rate will start to move in favor of India, which means the INR will start to appreciate. One immediate impact of INR appreciation is, as we all know, that this will uh, this will make the Indian exporters less competitive in the in the global context, and and that is the situation again. The RBI and the government wants to avoid because this entire "Make in India" rhetoric is hinged upon how successful our Indian exporters climb on the on the global value chains. So you see, there are there are you know multilateral problems to the same answer. But then everyone for the for the for, for and in India it's a, it's a very rare sight that monetary policy authorities and fiscal policy authorities as well as the corporate sector all are in sync in forwarding one agenda and that's the overall growth. So the monetary policy uh, uh, people or the monetary policy authorities are busy uh, ensuring that the exchange rate doesn't move in a way so that it hurts exporters. The fiscal policy uh, uh, authorities are ensuring that there is a steady inflow of capital from abroad because India domestically has a shortage of capital. So, so that's 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 how this this entire piece of various policy making and the role of corporate is coming together. And this is again a very rare phenomenon. And we, in fact, are very lucky to be seeing this phenomenon unfold in front of our eyes. And as this is definitely going down in history. So 10 years down the line, 15 years down the line, we'll definitely be looking back to this era, like how we do right now and talk about the 1991 reforms. 10 years down the line, we'll be doing the same for the reforms and, and the type of uh, actions that the RBI and the government are taking uh, right now. So please document them as much as you can, because if you can are able to write a good book out of it, uh, the royalty income for you would be immense. Anyways, so so that's 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 what the credit trading implication of the budget uh, kind of, uh, kind of would be, and and the other uh, important thing that I would want to talk today are a couple of budget announcements which had to do with easing the capital available in the market, 
the domestic capital available in the market. So we all know that the government is planning to borrow huge. So this time they are going to borrow about 12 lakh crores. Only in 2019, this amount was just half of it. So you can imagine the amount of money that this government will have to you know, suck out of the, of the total available pool of capital in an already capital starved economy. So then what would be left for the capital uh, for the for the corporate sector? So that's a big challenge that the government is grappling with. In fact, only yesterday I was in a closed door meeting uh, with other industry folks, with the with the secretary of uh, Department of Economic Affairs and the CEA. Uh, so so they were also quite uh, uh, you know aware of this problem which may come up. Uh, for now, the assumption is since this year is going to be a slow year, economic activity would be pushed largely by government expenditure. They are not expecting a lot of corporate borrowings to happen because they are expecting corporates to keep on their path of consolidation, merging, and all of that. So, so a lot of capex may not happen from corporates. But in case uh, economy turns out to be better than what it, it is being expected, then we can expect a lot of uh, demand for capital from the corporate sector also. So how is the government going to manage that is a big question that the entire finance ministry is grappling with right now. And uh, the good thing is they are, they are quite open to the fact that uh, to, to explore not just borrowing, the borrowing route, borrowing from domestic markets route, but also they are open to the idea of borrowing uh, from multilateral organizations or using PSIs to borrow abroad and so on and so forth. Obviously, these things have not been finalized and they will be finalized as and when uh, things unravel in front of us. But, but it's a good, it's a good uh, uh, feeling to know that the government is acknowledging that these problems can crop up and they are having a plan B uh, ready with them, which should ensure that uh, whenever a crisis arises, there's a very speedy resolution to that crisis. So one, one thing that they did, which again can go a long way in easing the availability of capital uh, through the corporate sector is, is uh, the announcement of a development finance institution. Now this has been a very long pending demand. Uh, a lot of us from the corporates had been uh, uh, recommending this to the finance ministry, the prime minister's office for quite some time now that we should have a development finance institution purely for the purpose of lending to projects which has a very long gestation period. So you would uh, appreciate the fact that setting up a factory is, is not a, a, a two year or a three year game, right? Setting up a factory can take up to five years. Building a road can take up to 10 years, five to eight years. So for these projects, availability of funding was dwindling uh, in our economy, especially after 2016, when the asset quality review happened. So after the asset quality review, uh, many of you would remember that there was this steep rise in NPAs, especially amongst the PSU banks. And in India, PSU banks are the largest source of lending for any type of corporate project. And once their NPA started or came out in the light, they became very edgy in terms of creating new loans, especially creating new long-term loans. And in India, long-term by defini RBI definition means anything which is more than three years. So if I to give you a statistic as to how long-term exposure of these banks have been going down, even just before the EQR, about 45 to 50% of the PSU loan book used to be about used to be you know loans which are three years or more now it has it has come down to 35 percent and it is continuously going down without any sign of a recovery so which means that these uh, PSU banks which are the largest lenders in the economy they have significantly cut down their exposure to long-term projects so then where would someone who's wanting to set up a factory and the building the factory would take say three four five years, Going to get the money from so, so that that problem can be addressed by the dfi so in, in in the interim before the dfi came you may ask the question you know how were people getting the money so that is where nbfcs were playing a big role so what nbfcs used to do was nbfcs do this heavy lifting of giving long-term credit to these long gestation projects however nbfcs used to do it by borrowing short term and lending long term so again, NBFCs also faced that same problem that banks were unwilling to lend to them on a long-term basis, right? But they took the risk 
they borrowed short term. So they would borrow for two years, but they would give a loan, which is for five years. And then they would, they would they, for the lifetime of the loan, they would borrow maybe two or three times so that they are not out of money at any point of time that the loan is running. However, after the ILN FS crisis, you may have, uh, you may recollect the ILN FS crisis, which happened in 2018. This entire business model of the NBFCs uh, went for a toss. Uh, after ILN FS, what happened was banks literally stopped giving them or rolling over their short-term loans. The moment NBFCs found that their short-term loan rollover window was blocked, they had a problem in you know, servicing the long-term assets that they had created in terms of long-term loans that they had given to their customers. So it, it put it very simply, they would have taken a two-year loan from a bank and had given it that same money to a, a, a corporate for five years. So that, five, that money is not going to come back to the NBFC in five years, but the bank after two years is asking for the money back from the NBFC. So where will the NBFC get the money? So this, this problem was called the asset liability mismatch, and that impacted the entire NBFC industry very, very significantly. The industry is still suffering from that blow as we speak today. And, and RBI and our government had to bring in a lot of uh, easy liquidity to help out these NBFCs to come out of this kind of a situation. It's still evolving, but, but yeah, there has been a lot of policy help. But the point I'm trying to make here is, so now that the NBFCs are also out of the picture in terms of giving long-term loans, banks were long out of the picture. So where would India get the capital to create long-term capex, right? to invest in long-term capex? So that, that is the reason why DFI made all the more sense. And hence the government this time has allowed the establishment of a DFI, which is great. Uh, obviously the implementation, the quick implementation would be the key. Uh, we would, uh, I want the DFI to be up and running in the next two, three months. Uh, if, this, uh, if this 2022 has to be a turnaround uh, year for the country. Uh, and the other good thing that the DFI would do is whatever little long-term financing the banks were doing, uh, that pressure would actually go away from the banks. So the banks will land up with a lot more free capital with them, which then they, they can you know, give, it to, give it for retail purposes or give it to short-term borrowers, et cetera, and bring down the cost of borrowing further. So, so that, that is another uh, you know, a windfall kind of a benefit which the DFI could create if if it is institutionalized uh, as soon as possible. The other, other good thing that I would want to refer to that was announced for the capital market was this concept of a bad bank. Again, a bad bank is something which is not new, exists in quite a few other uh, developed markets. And what it literally do, would do is uh, it'll, it will acquire a lot, lot of these NPAs from especially the PSUs because the PSUs are the ones, the public sector banks are the ones which are suffering from the crisis, from the, from the NPA crisis the most as of now. Uh, they would absorb a lot of these assets at a haircut, obviously, uh, at, at say 85% uh, of the assets value or 50% of the assets value, depending on how the negons happen. And they would try to later on service those debt or maybe downsell them to some asset reconstruction company, which can be foreign institutions also. So that opens up a door for further foreign investment in the country. And there are many specialized foreign funds whose only business is to just go and acquire stressed loans. So, so this bad bank would kind of act as an intermediary between the bank, which is carrying the non-performing non assets and the foreign investor who's, who, who is willing to take on such risky on performing assets and then by whatever securitization norms, convert them into profitable business uh, for, for these institutions. So, so that, that is a very, very interesting uh, concept and, and we are hoping that it, it, it again is uh, implemented as soon as possible. However, the, there's a problem, there's a very big problem. Now, a big reason for this to be a success is for these PSU banks to quickly arrive at a valuation of their NPAs and, and decide, ki, okay, if this is my NPA, uh, I am going to sell it to the you know, bad bank at a 20% discount or at a 40% discount because I'm not going to get any money out of it. 
So I, I should rather just get rid of it. But if I get rid of it, my book will be set back by 40% of the value. Now that call needs to be taken by someone. And, and what we, we have seen over the past few years is because of the structure in which these PSU banks operate, every management man, every CMD or the, the chairman has a rotationary uh, you know, period. They are transferred or they, they retire every three years. So there is no long-term vision which is associated with the chairman's office. And that creates a problem of incentive. Who would want to take the risk? And on top of that, there is this huge risk of, you know, vigilance office or enforcement directorate or CBI, which may tomorrow say that, okay, you had valued the loan at a discount of 20%, but I think there was some corruption here. It should have been valued at 10% uh, discount and not 20%. So the, there must have been some, you know, corruption and, and hence that the person who valued it uh, goes behind the bar. Now, these things are very common nowadays in the banking fraternity for the right reasons, of course, because of the amount of uh, problems we face with Kingfisher or uh, uh, Gitanjali Diamonds, etc. But then this, this overly st strict uh, regulatory uh, purview of PSU banks particularly has reduced the incentive of the, the, the managers who are in the driver's seat for valuing such bad loans and then deciding to set it off to the bad bank, uh, they just don't have the incentive. So we have to figure out, or the government has to figure out a way to incentivize these people to ring fence them from later uh, uh, re re regulatory or legal uh, challenges so that this kind of a concept takes off quickly and the public sector banks can get rid of the uh, bad loans as soon as possible. Uh, the problem is more pronounced because if you have noticed during the, the COVID period, when institutions were in dire need of loans because they were not able to do business, there was no re revenue coming in. And even to meet working capital requirements, institutions, be it large, be it small, they needed uh, money to be borrowed from either a bank or from the debt market. But during this phase, if you are tracking uh, banking sector uh, closely, the credit deposit ratio of almost every type of bank, be it a private bank or a or or, or a, a you know a private bank, the credit deposit ratio had started to decline very steadily. So, for example, the average credit deposit ratio of a private bank typically is close to 99%, which means 99% of the deposits are given out as credit. So that means how much credit the bank has uh, given. Now, that came down for private banks to about 75%. So only 75% of the deposits after setting aside reserves, et cetera, was given out as credit. So in case of PSU banks, the situation was much more stark. So there, on an average, it is about 75% during COVID-10. of problems for many uh, you know smaller uh, many smaller uh, institutions uh, to, to continue with even their working capital needs and unfortunately my feeling is this year we are going to see a lot of consolidation of these small, medium to small players who were not able to get access to their oxygen or which is capital in, in the previous year during the lockdown they, they would be either shutting down shops or they would be amalgamated with bigger organizations reducing competitive spirit in the markets, reducing number of jobs, and reducing uh, you know, the, the entire amount of capital that needs to be invested in the economy. So that's, that's kind of the kind of problem that we will run into in the corporate sector, and that could primarily be because of the lack of support from banks during this uh, crisis period. So it's, it's high time that the government or the uh, RBI did something to infuse uh, confidence within bankers so that they start to lend more. And I think this budget was in the right track to do that. But again, implementation, the key lies in implementation and we have to wait to see how uh, spirited the government uh, machinery is in implementing whatever they had promised in the budget. So with this, I'll stop and see if there are any questions. Um, thank you. Thank you, Debopam, for an insightful address on uh, sharing us the perspective from the corporate uh, industry. Um, that how do corporates look at the budgets and what are the implications of the 
uh, the expanding fiscal deficit on the corporate borrowings. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a few questions. So first I will take uh, Ridhiman. So Ridhiman is our um, second year BSc economics students. Uh, Ridhiman, I have asked you to unmute. Could you just go ahead with your question? Uh, hi, am I audible? Yes, perfectly. Hi, uh, good evening, sir. Um, so yeah. I actually had a question regarding the vehicle scrappage policy. And the thing is, this is actually from a different perspective, one that I have, haven't really come across while reading or trying to just know more about it. And it actually correlates with the vehicular electrification policy that the government had proposed, wherein the government wanted to make the country uh, have an 100% vehicular electrification rate by 2030. So my question is, um, on paper, the vehicle scrappage policy seems like the ideal policy measure to help guide the country into the vehicular electrification thing, but the timelines don't match. So how is the government hoping to bridge these two policies with such a differing timeline? Because the second phase of the policy, the electrification policy is supposed to start in 2022 with commercial car sales being mandatory by 2023. But then again, the government is also looking to implement the scrappage policy by 2022 as well. So does that time lag actually impact the electrification policy? And if so, how, what's the consequence of this? So Ridhiman, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, what I can, I am not from the auto sector, so I may not have a lot of insights into that. But what I have realized by speaking to fellow economists in auto companies like Maruti and Tata is, this scrappage policy had been under the works for quite some time. Uh, I think the first time it was suggested was eight years ago, but because of whatever reasons, uh, this was not coming through. Uh, and, and this time when the government was actually clearing its backlog of expected policies, be it the DFI, be it the bad bank, be it the scrappage policy, they also included the scrappage policy. So the main purpose of the scrappage policy is to first create a market for vehicular scraps. And as per some estimates, I think there's a BCG estimate on that. If a, a full-fledged scrappage policy is introduced, uh, which is involuntary and, and mandatory, a $6 billion scrappage market can gen be generated, which will create its own uh, ecosystem, new jobs, new, new uh, industry, and all of it. And on top of that, it's going to support the entire automobile industry, be it electrical vehicles, which is a, which is a new concept. It was not there back eight years back when this, uh, this, uh, this, this suggestion first came, uh, but also help sell the conventional uh, the, uh, petrol uh, diesel vehicles. So from that perspective, I think this is a boost to the overall vehicular uh, industry in general and laying the foundation stone for creating a new industry and that is the vehicle scrappage industry altogether. Whether it will gel with the electric uh, uh, plans, electric motor, motor plans that the government has needs to be seen as to how this policy is worded. As of now, this is a voluntary policy. You, there's no need, there's no, there'll be no mandate, ma mandate as to when a vehicle has to be uh, you know, retired and stuff like that. But uh, if there are strong incentives, then obviously people will go for it. And if the strong incentives are in favor of electric vehicle, then obviously the, the electrified, electrification of uh, consumer vehicle plans that the government has will also get a shot in the arm. Uh, thank you, Devupam. Uh, I have a question to ask. Uh, Devupam, uh, when it comes to employment, so many of our like master's students or bachelor's students so we are also concerned about our placements. So when it comes to place uh, the job creation, so what do you feel is the scenario going to be um, for the rest of this calendar year uh, about the hiring scene, about you know looking at how the budget has presented the picture of economy where we are expecting 11% uh, GDP growth rate uh, in the fiscal year 21, 22, how would you look at the job creation perspective? Is it like the companies, uh, if they are not expanding their businesses, so the job creation is going to be limited? How do you look at the job creation scenario? Uh, that's a very relevant question. So 
just to give you a, a context to that, uh, which will help me answer your question also. Thank you, sir. So the tax collection estimate for FY22 is 22.17 lakh crores, and it's in the budget uh, estimates, right? And this is this was 24.23 lakh crores last year. And last year, obviously, the government did not know that we will be hit by COVID. The only, the only data point that the government had was the previous year, or a slowdown year. And the, the, the FY20 year would also be kind of a weak year, but maybe a little better than FY19. Compared to that, in FY22, they're expecting a tax collection which is lesser than that, which means economic activity from the private sector is going to be weaker than what it was in FY19. So which means that if there is no, if there is lower private activity, then that directly corroborates with the fact that employment generation by private sector is going to be a little muted than what it was in FY19 and obviously in FY20. Uh, so that's that's kind of a partial answer to your question. Getting a job this year is going to be tough, especially in the private sector. Even the government is accepting it in terms if it, it, it's there in their uh, tax collection data. You have to just read between the lines. Uh, this year, the entire economic activity would be boosted by government expenditures. And hence, they have this huge borrowing mandate of 12 lakh crores. They're knowing very well that 12 lakh crores is something that will entirely, uh, you know, mop up every possible, every little penny that would be available in the in the in the liquidity market, leaving nothing for the corporates because the government expects that the corporates will not be in the market to borrow. Because again, the government expects that the corporates will do very little activity this year. Uh, so, so job outlook remains weak, uh, and hence there has been no significant, ex, uh, you know, uh, boost towards uh, consumption as well. Because this is the year to save and not consume is what the government, I think, is giving a signal, and and this is this is going to have a bleak. Uh, so, so that hence my uh, bleak outlook in in favor of uh, job creation. In the private sector, uh, in the in the current year, in the, in the new year. I'm so sorry, the, Barun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have given me a perspective. So the uh, one is formal job market and an informal. So informal may be the unskilled uh, job creation, and uh, skilled will be like so. Generally, many of our students work for um, uh, the companies which work in turn for uk or us you know the market research firm or equity research firms so many of our students get opportunity in such uh, consultancy organizations so that i hope is um, maybe they are going to outsource to india the jobs of uh, the research you know back end secondary research jobs and uh, that would keep us engaged uh, much of the students that is what is what we are hoping and uh, i have a question sir uh, may i request seven seven is also our alumni and my former colleague as well so seven i'm just unmuting you um, yes seven please unmute yes go ahead yeah, Debugum, sir. Uh, my question was not exactly related to the budget, but something the RBI announced allowing uh, retail investors to directly enter the G government sec uh, securities market. So, do you think is it is it is it like a alternate to retail investors or common man when the savings rate real savings rate is negative, or is it that the retail investors are quite a sizable force that you know they can provide enough money for the government to borrow so what do you think of this retail di uh, direct i am not sure what the name was but this direct retail window that the rbi is opening and what do you think would be the benefits for the government or for savers thank you thanks evan for the question so here the government is competing with uh, banks in terms of uh, the fixed deposit customers, right? And in India, for whatever reasons, uh, people have been people have shied away from capital markets. The capital market penetration in India remains quite weak. Uh, but then, when it comes to fixed deposits or post office deposits, the 
you you see such uh, accounts that the quantum of such accounts to be very very large and and this is exactly what the government is targeting so at the time when fixed deposits are not giving you interest of more than 5 or 6% for a 5 year deposit a government uh, bond will give you about you know again 6 7% along with uh, the the fact that you are investing in the debt markets with with the with possible upsides to these interest rates as and when interest cycle changes and the other biggest so obviously this is going to increase the liquidity uh, for government bonds and one of the reasons why this was done is in order to make the debt markets ready for uh, getting listed in the some of the global debt indexes so that's the kind of near term goal for the finance ministry is to get indian debt especially gsex government debt to be listed in either the jp morgan bond index or a couple of other bond index now the benefit of getting listed in one of those indexes is uh, a lot of uh, etfs such as exchange traded funds a lot of huge debt mutual funds globally they just blindly track those indexes so whoever is listed in those index these guys just put money in terms in 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 proportion with the weightage that that company or that security has in that index so if india manages to get a place in any one such index we will see a huge amount of foreign inflows in the indian debt market so a large part of the government's problem of uh, you know getting capital by selling debt would be resolved by this uh, say if i was just reading a goldman sachs uh, report and they estimated that even if one government bond gets listed in the jp morgan bond index that will bring immediately about 3 billion dollars and we are talk, talking about just one security and we are talking about just one index so you can understand the quantum of this uh, surge and how is it in, in uh, how is it uh, related with the retail piece is the reason why our in, our bonds were not so far listed in the in, in the in the foreign indexes was because of this lack of depth in the market uh, there were very few buyers in the market the buyers are only the mutual funds and the banks now if you add a whole new buying force that being the retail guys and the retail guys don't consider them to be a small force because as i just told you the entire fixed deposit clientele would be the clientele for this bond uh, that will immensely increase the market depth the liquidity uh, so as to say and hence when foreign investors would invest into these uh, index into this gsex in india they would have the option to get out of it whenever they want to right now they don't they cannot do that because of lack of liquidity they may buy a gsec 10 year but if they want to sell it tomorrow they are not able to sell it because there are not other buyers available in the market at that point in time but if you increase the number of buyers that problem would be eased and this will be a feather in the cap uh, for our gsecs to be included into the uh, bond market index oh, thank you thank you seven i hope um, sir has answered your question yeah thank you seven uh may I thank you depopam sir for answering the question and uh, may i now request uh, dr suchi uh, my colleague uh, to for give a formal vote of thanks uh, thank you so much everyone Uh, so on behalf of symbiosis school of economics i thank both the speakers uh, dr lekha but she has already left the meeting and debopam choudhary for sharing your opinions today and i think after the talk today we have become better informed uh, in context of both the macro fiscal aspect and the corporate aspect as far as the union budget is concerned so uh, we look forward to more such meaningful interactions and you know uh, all this really enlightens our mind so uh, thank you so much and uh, a special mention to our director dr jyoti chandiramani for encouraging us to organize such talks for a better understanding and learning for both the students and the staff and i also want to thank shalmali and the technical team of um, Ms. Uh, Shilpi Singh and Janardhan for the smooth functioning of the session. And lastly, I want to thank all the students and the faculty for uh, joining the session today. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Deepam sir, for sparing your uh, time in in spite of your busy schedule and your corporate commitments.
thank you very much sir we are uh, very grateful to you thanks thank for you. the invite and do uh, convey my regards to professor jyoti yes yes sir thank you very much thank you everyone for joining uh, we are ending this meeting thank you everyone